Hello. <laughs> How you doing, everyone? Uh, I, I've been, uh, I was running a little late this morning, and uh, I decided, well, I better have a cup of coffee. So, anyway. Uh, hey, Junior and Indrajit and Raj and Tony and Clyde and Bruce. How you guys doing? <laughs> Good to see everyone. Uh, yesterday, we had a quickie. And uh, one of the uh, someone pointed out that I, I somehow got distracted. <laughs> Not hard to distract me when we're talking about watches. And uh, what I was talking about was I started to anyway. This particular watch, this is a Vacheron Constantin um, of Easterique American 1921. Uh, so my 21, uh, one of the things that I've always thought, well, this is, you know, this thing takes forever to wind. And it was, it's like, you know, it got like a two-day charge at most. And I just thought they put in a spring a mile long or something. And so I was always, it took me a long time to wind it. Apparently, though, uh, that's not correct. Uh, what they've done with the 4400, which, by the way, is wonderfully accurate um, movement, despite the fact that it's got this little bitty uh, balance and, uh, well, it runs at uh, 4 hertz, which to me is supersonic. <laughs> but anyway, what I found out was sort of interesting, and it has to do with uh, what I was hoping to talk about today, and that is constant force in, in a watt. And apparently what it is, is that they put a very strong str um, mainspring in in the watch. And instead of having you go, ah, they geared it down. So, you know, like when you, if you've ever ridden a, you know, 10, 15 speed bike, they, you know, you're pedaling like mad and you're going up a hill. And the, the same thing is true when you wind a watch. If it's, you got a stronger uh, spring, it's harder to wind, but if you gear it down, you can do it. It just takes a lot longer. And essentially, um, one of the things that I realized is that with a stronger uh, spring, I don't know. I I keep thinking, well, it must have you know a better constant charge because it's a really strong spring. That's one thing. Of course, the other other way to read it is it's got this you know big muscle spring, and it may push it forward a little at the beginning and then then it'll flatten off at the end but it doesn't it's uh, it's it's got a good charge all the way through and this is what you know the constant force is about and um so some of the things I thought well let's let's kick around some more things that are like you know n n not the the um, Rimantois Galate which is you know <laughs> which I'd love to have but they're too expensive uh, one of the things we mentioned yesterday was a parallel double barrels, which is another thing that will flatten that out and smooth everything out, but we haven't talked about too much. Oh, let's see. Oh, my goodness. Hi, Tony and Eddie. How you guys doing? Um, <laughs> Dominic. Uh, hi, Ian. How you doing, Thomas? Oh, okay. Andrew, how you doing, Andrew? Okay, uh, and Thomas, uh, is that Thomas? I said hi to Thomas twice. <laughs> anyway, uh, so anyway, so this is this is one one of the things that I thought. Well, let's let's uh, <laughs> let's talk about this. Clyde said, "Wasn't Constant Force a movie from the eighties? <laughs> it does sound like actually more of the seventies." Um, <laughs> Okie okay, no. doke. Uh, so, what are some of the common? Well, what are some of the let's say, I'll say, common, common force. And, and this led to story time. And uh, this is a book that I, I, I go to a lot. And if you don't have it, I highly recommend it. By the way, there's a new edition uh, of um, George Daniels' book, The Art of Breguet, that's going to be coming out. I think it'll be out in May or something, but they're pre-ordering. It's 120 bucks, which I know sounds like a lot, but that particular book, I think, more than any other uh, publication by George Daniels, beside beside this one, is responsible for the kind of watchmaking that F.P. Jorn did. 
because FP Jorn gave a lot of credit to um, uh, George Daniels, but I, and I wondered, you know, he was such a he was so dedicated. Uh, FP Jorn is to Breguet and sort of the French um, history uh, or the French tradition of watchmaking. And so, you know, I always, so once, once I found that book and I saw some other comments that uh, were made by F.P. John, I realized is that that's probably one that uh, I think would be really a valuable uh, book to have. And they're coming out with a new edition of it. Um, so anyway, I just thought all of you guys would like to know that. Hey, Flippin' Zippo and Alex, how you doing? Hi, Jean-Paul Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> crazy guys okay um so anyway what i thought you know what are some little things that you know you don't have to have uh anything big and, and one of the things i was i found in here was they have a um the the curb regulator and um a curb regulator is is really what is the kind of regulator that's in most watches. And uh, let me see if I can find a thing. Um, what I wanted to read to you, and of course I don't have a bookmark like I should, is the is what he says about the difference between a curb regulator and a free sprung regulator, and why a, a free sprung um, regulator he thinks is better. By the way, too, I think I, I may have may or may not have mentioned this, but this book, all of the watches in this book by uh, Daniels and the ones he uses for illustration are key wound. <laughs> right? he, he has some kind of comment about, well, oh, you lazy bums, <laughs> if you can't wind it with a key, you don't deserve to have a watch. Hi, Javi. How you doing, man? <laughs> uh, free sprung is more stable. Um, well, there's something else about it. I think it's in relationship to a curb regulator that what happens is that with a curb regulator you change the length of a spring okay you don't do it by stretching it but you do it by uh, I think sliding a sort of a locking mechanism sort of like if you have a rope and you and you want to make it shorter you just grab it up and, and I think that's what a curb regulator does let me see if I can find this real quick um, Three forty. Okay. Um, this is now. I'm reading this like a bedtime story. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I love this. Uh, he, and he's he, he's talking when, when he talked about curb regulators. He he just refers to them as regular. He said. Uh, regulators are a convenience to uh, makers of mass-produced watches, but are not necessarily in good quality hand-finished watches. Such watches are bought to uh, time by adjusting the balance and subsequent regulation of the rate is not required. Okay, now let me see. Um, okay, now this is talking about um, I feel like this is story time, guys. <laughs> this, if if you have a this what a spring, uh, he said, if the spring is biased a little towards the inner pin, you're talking about the inner and outer pins on a curb regulator. Um, he said it will rest upon it increasingly as the balance amp amplitude decreases and the short arcs will be quickened. The results are not sufficiently precise for precision timekeeper, and if the regulator is moved, the effect is changed. So the the, the accidental movement of it, I think, of a of a regulator, is I think pretty well um, tackled by a, a swan neck. You've seen a swan neck, and uh, you got a screw on one side, and then you got the this one that going around and pushing on the other side of the regulator arm. And so the, so I don't think those are going to slip. On the other hand, the kind of regulator that you find in a, um, let me see if I got one here. Um, 
kind you find. This is this is my bang up, um, <laughs> my bang up movement. So I don't have my finger cuts on. I apologize, but with this one, this is for goofing around. Oh, this one doesn't have that. It's, this one's got a different kind of regulator in it. Let me check this one. But when I get these watches, by the way, if you get a watch movement, I like, I mean, for a pretentious watchmaker, there's nothing like a regulator because you can you can play real watchmaker and adjust them. And it works. Okay. Let's see what I've missed in here when I've been going on and on and on. Uh, let's see. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's story time, kids. <laughs> Bruce. Okay. Um, my, oh, my fly. No, what it is is that my penguin uh, got these, um, oh, I don't know, you know, those glider wings that they have <laughs> leaving all of the other penguins behind so long suckers okay let me see if i can find it okay let me see if you can see this now okay see that little thing right here that little stick now that's your that's your regulator arm and what you do with it let me put it in here so i i don't I'm holding it by holding it by the stem, by the way, like a good like a good watchmaker. <laughs> okay. Yeah, what you do with that is that this guy, uh, I just I just use like a uh, you can use any non-magnetic. I use a um, one of those little pegwood sticks that you have in, you know, the that comes with a, usually when you start watchmaking, you get some pegwood sticks. I use the pegwood sticks to move it just ever so slightly. Now, if you have a regulator arm on it, I mean, a, a, a gooseneck arm, what you do is that you have to get a little screwdriver and you turn it and it moves it just ever so much. And then the spring of the back of it, Holds it in place. So while, yeah, okay, you got other kinds of problems <laughs> that could come up that uh, uh, George Daniels pointed out. Those that can be a problem. Okay, hi, crappy, how you doing? Um, so I guess as far as George Daniels is concerned, a properly designed and built movement didn't need a regulator. Yes, Clyde, that's exactly right. Uh, you use it. You use the. Um, you change the inertia balances on the, um, uh, you know, there, there are different kinds. Uh, the one that we were looking at the other day, you know, the, you know, the watch that we had, uh, the Rolf Lang watch, remember that one? Ah, nuts. Um, hang on, let me draw this out real quick. <laughs> this is something. Um, this, is, this is nothing against Zoom. But um, anybody taking a watchmaking course, it is so much nicer in person. You know, this is back in the old days before we had the pandemic, we could actually get together as groups. And um, in, in terms of watchmaking, I, I know some people are trying to take it, you know, all, yeah, you have to. I mean, what, what are we going to do? But there was this little girl uh, who was talking about school and, and taking it, you know, using Zoom. And she says, yeah, we can't go to school anymore. We got to use that poopy Zoom. <laughs> what are you talking about? Hang on a second. Let me get my, I, I use a fountain pen here. So let me get the old fountain working. And I'll show you the kind of, it's a quadra something or other that, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Oh, uh, God, too many of them. George Daniels student name escapes me right now. Um, <laughs> Clyde, enough of that. <laughs> okay.
this is the one that was on the um, ah, come on, you guys, Roger Smith, yeah, on Roger Smith. It's called it a quad or something or other, and it looks like this. Um, this is your balance right here, and you have four spokes, and at the tip of each spoke is a weight. And the way you regulate it is to move those weights, okay? Now, the ones that are on um, uh, H. Moser, they, the ones that I said that look like a porcupine, they do. <laughs> they have all of these little, uh, what do they call inertia weights around it. And each weight has one exactly like it at the opposite end. And so to balance it, you you adjust the weights so that you get it just right. Now, this is what, this is a type of constant force, okay? Now, another, another thing about constant force that I think is, again, these are, you know, pretty simple things. Um, one is the higher the frequency, the more stable things are going to be, okay? It's sort of like riding a bicycle. You faster you go, your bicycle is not going to fall over. And so if you have a faster frequency, you end up with greater stability. Now, there are other kinds of problems that the faster frequency uh, makes. And so one solution is to have larger um, buh, 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 um, a larger size balance, okay? And so your larger size balance will give you the stability and you can do it with, you can get your stability, which means your constant force, better constant force uh, at a lower rate, which means less wear and tear on your movement parts. You know, so you, you have all of these trade-offs. Um, Carrie, uh, Carrie Wooten Lana, who makes these fabulous watches, uh, he has, he's famous for those nice big uh, balance wheels. And uh, when F.P. Jorn, somebody showed me their F.P. Jorn um, watch, and it was an Octa. And uh, it had a much bigger balance on it. Uh, and uh, there was a comment by Jorn saying, you know, was, by not having these double barrels and some other things, he's able to have a bigger uh, balance. So this is another trade-off. Like on, the, on my, uh, it's, it's, hmm, I don't know, what is it? Chronomet Surveyn, uh, it has the double barrels in parallel, but the balance is a little smaller, not small, but just a little smaller than the bigger one that it was able to put into the certain uh, octaves. And then he had the, the oscillation weight above it rather than uh, inside of it like uh, uh, Jean-Marc Viderec did on my uh, time here, time there. So these, these are all things that go into it, and it's sort of like, a, uh, to me, uh, as, as a pretentious watchmaker, I don't, get, I don't get much choice in that, except, I, you know, unless I can find a watch that has some of these characteristics already. Okay, uh, I've gone on and on way too much. What are you guys going on? Okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Let's see. I had an old watch Smith look at my Moser move. And he said it looked top notch pocket watch movement from the old days. That's quite possible because that's when H. Moser began. They, when H. Moser sort of was reborn back in, had two rebirths, I think. Or one was in the early, early, late, late 90s, I think. And then again in the early 2000s. And um, they they had these wonderful they, well they still have them i guess uh watches with these these very nice hand wound movements now uh the hmc 200 and all of the the, the newer ones are are all automatic so and they're no longer two and a half hertz they're up to this lightning speed of three hertz okay what's going on let's see Hi, Thomas Lim. Uh, thanks. Uh, how, how do some perpetual calendar watches have only manual winding and not self-winding? My guess is this. Okay, and this is a guess, Thomas. Um, 
and H. Moses Perpetual is a great example, is that you're going to need, uh, I think, a little more, um, more complications and more modules. And so if you put an automatic in there, you're making the case fatter because it's going to be fatter than a nice thin one. And so if you put an automatic in there, um, you have you sort of add complications to where there already is some serious complication. Perpetual uh, calendars are serious complications. Big fat springs <laughs> that are in this one are not complications. They're not so much complications, but like in this guy, uh, my Roger Dubuis, um man, I like this watch. Um, nice big one. And the movement is this thing keeps wonderful time. By the way, too, let me let me add one more thing. If I hadn't said it already, I I, I got I was a little late getting started, <laughs> so I I get discombobulated. This watch, when I got it, I got the fabulous price on it. This is a Parmigiani uh, Calpa. I, I I just love this watch, and it was always slow when I bought it. It was slow. And I asked him, who cares? <laughs> I like to watch. And um, finally, the stem broke or something in the stem mechanism, in the keyless mechanism. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll send it in for, um, you know, for service plus an overhaul. When they sent that thing back, this thing is not only was it, I think they polished it up for me too. Not only is it like a new watch. This thing, the time on this thing, this is how come I knew it was serious late. I was in the kitchen trying to make my coffee. And this thing I just blasted before it was slow. And so I was okay. But now it's like really accurate. So that's another thing. If you've got a watch that's giving you some trouble, um, you know, send it in for service. That was uh, somebody, I got a, I got a note from someone uh, in one of the comments. They said they had a, I think it was an Oris uh, Power something. Wait, is that is that by Oris? A, what's the Powermatic 80? That's not Oris, is it? Um, uh, let's see. Anyway, um, hi, now, said the He sent it in. I think it was either Powermatic or it was one of those ones that could only be regulated by the serve by the uh, company. Um, Clyde, I, I forgot the. I, it, it may be a it may be one of those uh, System Fifty Ones. It was something that only the you had to send in. You couldn't give it to your your local guy and and, and fix it. And he said. He said he got it from a secondary market, and he didn't get it from a certified AD. And uh, they were really cool about it. They charged him 80 bucks, sent it back, and he says this thing is, runs perfectly now. And, you know, 88 bucks for a, for a service <laughs> after what I paid for this and my FP Jorn sounds like, you know, it cost them more than that to ship it. Uh, so that's one thing I do recommend, uh, you know, when it's time, it's time and to get your um, your watch service. The the idea of having, well, you got to do it every so many years and so forth. That really depends on how much you use it. Uh, I try to rotate my watches. And so, you know, maybe my watches are used one seventh of the time that they would be if I were wearing it every day. When I had my uh, overseas, I used to wear that overseas every day to work, and so it got a lot of a uh, lot of use out of it. But most of these other ones, I rotate all over the place, and so they're they're they feel lucky if they get a, a little time with it. Uh, how much was service on the Calpa? <coughs> um, how much was service on the? <laughs> I forgot. It was just north of 1,000. I know it's a lot. Of, that's a lot for a service. But they did a bang-up job. It was a service plus an overhaul. But, you know, the thing of it was, it wasn't uh, the ones for the FP Jorns weren't that much more. 
I, it's a lot. I, I realize that it's a lot of money, but this watch was broken and uh, because of the stem was busted on it. You know, what are you going to do? You know, you don't, you don't want to ditch a watch, you know, because this thing was, you know, it, th this is another thing, too. I was thinking, if you get a really good buy on a watch, sometimes it will need service. And I think that's something you could factor in both to the price you want to pay for it and how you negotiate for it. You know, wh when was the last service on this? Well, this one, I can, you know, say this was done in 2020. <laughs> so... Uh, on the other hand, my both my FP Jorns were done in 2017, and you know they get if they're lucky if they get you know a weekly wear out of it, and so I don't wear them as much, and so and they're running perfectly. One of the things I found out though, uh, my Chronomat Surveying uh, does uh, magnetize easily, and I got my I got a cheap I got one of those cheap demagnetizers, but if I use it enough, it worked. Hi, Hans. How you doing? Alberto, how are you? <laughs> Hans and Hans. Uh, okay, so... Um, okay, what are some other things that we have with a mechanical watch that is an important thing? By the way, too, what I just mentioned, magnetizing, getting a watch magnetized. Apparently, I don't know what it was. I thought it was my ceiling fan. Because it, it, I think it wore out its uh, whatever wears out on an electric motor, uh, the brushes and stuff. And I got to get a new one. And I thought, well, maybe that's what happened. The thing put up a magnetic field. And of course, with my computers and all of this stuff around here, there's other, that's another place. So I try to keep them away from it. Um, my two hundred dollar <laughs> perpetual regulator. I don't think that thing. I think it parts are made out of bamboo or something because it doesn't magnetize at all. It's really great. How do you recommend someone in the states goes about an, an apprenticeship in watchmaking? Okay, Alberto. Uh, let me tell you what I did just as sort of a start to see if you like it or not. That's a good question. That's something else I think we we need for a topic is making our own watches. Um, the, hey, Stephen. Um, okay. Yeah, that, you know, that was another thing too. Uh, Rolex, they use um, free-sprung uh, movements. That's that's a good thing. That part them on um, spring is part of the way that they keep them from magnetizing. I don't like silicon, but that's me. And I know that uh, they have two kinds of uh, Rolex has both the silicon and the, what they call a part Parchimon or something like that. <laughs> Pokemon. I don't know. Hi, educating Celita. Cool. Okay. Okay, you guys are drinking. <laughs> oh, you made beef bouchonion. Oh. My goodness. Of course, it's later over there. Here, we're still in the morning. Hey, Raj. Apparently, traveling on the London Underground plays havoc with some watches due to the electric pickup rails on a train. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if that happens, you know, with the New York subway, too. Ah, Salita. Educating Salita. Great. Uh, let's see. Paracrome. That's the one, Bruce. Paracrome hairspring. Hawking uh, I think they're made from niobium, but I'm not sure what the other major metal is in the uh, parachrome. It could be chrome, because I know that chrome is used as an anti-magnetic uh, thing. I don't know if it's silicon or not, Hans. In, in the part, in the um, parachrome, it's silicon. <laughs> Okay, well, that's. I thought they had one that they didn't use silicon on. Okay, hey, underachieving, how you doing? Okay, uh, well, listen, I uh, let me again apologize for getting started late, but um, cell phones don't affect watches, do they? I don't know, that's a good question. Um, you know. But they always have accurate time. <laughs> That's one thing I'll say about a cell phone. Eh, my, what time it is? My watch stopped. I'll check my phone. That, 
Okay, uh, let's see. Magnets in the speakers. Ah, okay. I'll be darned. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, 5 a.m. in California. I'm here. Anybody else in Cali? Hey, Alberto, uh, we'll be having another one this afternoon. It'll be 1 o'clock California time. I'm a, I'm a transplanted um, uh, Californian, so even, I've been on the East Coast here in Connecticut for 21 years, and actually probably longer than that, come to think of it. Uh, more like 24 years. Wow, I've been here a long time. But um, so, I, so I'm aware of the different coastal time, but 5 o'clock in the morning is, is even early for me, and I like to get up early. Uh, great. You're welcome. All right, guys. Well, listen, um, my time is up, and uh, Clyde, where's Clyde? Clyde usually tells me when it's, the frying pan is coming down on my head <laughs> for being quiet. So uh, I'll be back uh, 4 o'clock uh, New York time, 1 o'clock uh, California time, and I think at 2100, uh, yeah, 2100 universal, universal time. So <laughs> getting some hot salsas. That's important, Clyde. Anyway, guys. Uh, everybody take care and be safe. This stupid pandemic is still with us, even though there's a cure on the horizon. Maybe we'll all, maybe by October, we'll be able to go to the What Time Show again in New York. Hope so. Take care, guys. <laughs>